We're going to be continuing our study in the Old Testament. We've reached the portion we consider the divided kingdom. We've just finished up, uh, Jesse just finished up covering Solomon. That's the end of the United Kingdom. And tonight I'm tasked with doing the overview of the divided kingdom. What was that song again? 207. 207. And I sympathize now with William and Nathan. I think they've had the majority of the overviews thus far. And it's kind of difficult to cover a large amount of passages, a lot of material, briefly, and not get into everybody else's lessons because you're talking about what they're about to talk about. And uh, so I found that kind of difficult. So uh, I decided to spend a little bit more time. If, if I was going to do a brief overview of the divided kingdom, Basically, you've got Israel and Judah, and Israel's horrible the whole time. Every single king is bad, and they fall into destruction very quickly, and Judah isn't quite as bad, and they last on a little longer. Now, that's a pretty brief synopsis of what happens here, but uh, so I decided I'll spend a little bit more time covering on how we got here, how we got to this point. Of our kingdom being divided we just came out of a united kingdom we had david conquering the land uh, and we have solomon growing the kingdom it's um, very prosperous we see a very affluent kingdom it says that gold and silver were like stones on the ground uh, and so how did we get from that point to here our next portion our kingdom being split and Jesse touched on it at the end of his lesson remember at the end of Solomon's reign he started turning away from God and we see that in first Kings chapter 11 if you want to turn there we're going to be there uh, around first Kings chapter 11 quite a bit this evening but Solomon starts turning away from the Lord he starts uh, he's drawn away by all the wives that he had as uh, Jesse was taught us he starts participating in the idolatrous worship he's uh, worshiping the Ashtaroth and uh, different gods Baal and the gods of his foreign wives and God becomes angry with him and so the Lord starts raising up adversaries to Solomon and we see, we start, we begin seeing the fringes of Solomon's kingdom starting to erode. It's not taken away from him during his lifetime, but we see the fringes of his kingdom starting to erode late in his reign. I'd like to re read 1 Kings chapter 11, 9 through 13. First Kings chapter 11, 9 through 13. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. Yet for David's sake, yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. So we see here, God promises Solomon because of all the wicked things you've done, later in your life you're not going to get to keep your kingdom your son is not going to reign over the whole kingdom i'm going to tear away the majority of the kingdom and give it to one of your servants but because i promised david i made a promise to david you're, there's still going to be a tribe left for david's line to rule over and that's going to be judah so we hear see we see here that the nation is going to be split between the northern portion of David and Solomon's kingdom and a small portion in the south. There's going to be Israel in the north and only Judah in the south. But I said there were, that 
God started raising up adversaries. One of those adversaries was Hadad. Now, while David was still alive, uh, his chief officer, Joab, was in the land of Edom down here. And I think they were there 16 months, six months, 16 months, one of those two. And they killed every male in the land, every single one of them. But except for this guy, Hadad, he was a little kid at the time. And he was the son of the king of Edom. And some of the king's servants rushed him away, saved him, and took him down to Egypt when he was a child. That's all the way he's going to leave. From here, they rush him over here. Down in there somewhere in Egypt. And he meet, uh, comes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh becomes uh, affectionate toward him. He, he likes Hadad. He gives him a portion of land. He gives them an allotment of food that he's allowed to have. He grows in favor with Pharaoh so much that Pharaoh allows Hadad to marry his wife's sister. So becomes his brother-in-law. Hadad becomes Pharaoh's brother-in-law. Well, time passes by. I'm sure by the time he got married, he was a little bit older than the child he... Well, I don't know actually things were doing back then. He might have married as a child. Uh, <laughs> but time passes on he hey that hears that david has passed away joab that man who had killed everyone in his land and killed his father had passed away so really interesting this whole period the divided kingdom period is full of really interesting stories now you read over a portion of scripture that's only about that long on your page but if you think about uh what you're reading it really it's just as good as any blockbuster movie or trilogy or series like Lord of the Rings or any book series. It's full of intriguing stories. And this is one of them here. We have a, a boy whose father was killed by a man. He rushes away to another faraway land. And then years later comes back for revenge. He comes back. He asks Pharaoh, he says, let me go back to the, to the land of my father's because the man that killed my father is dead. And he wants to put himself in a position to one day regain his father's land. And Pharaoh basically says, well, what, what do you lack here? I mean, is there, what, what's wrong with living here? You have everything you could possibly want, but that's not quite good enough when you've got revenge in your heart. And so, Hadad says again, let me go. And so, he does, he moves back to Eden. And we see throughout time that starting to be a problem. It plagued Solomon a little bit in the, in the later years of his reign. And then we see that throughout this divided kingdom period, we see that come to fruition. That's a problem there. So that was one adversary that rose up. Uh, another adversary was Rezon, or Rezon. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. This was a man that uh, had gathered men together and, and for, formed raiding bands after they would go through and conquer and kill uh this guy was forming men together and then these places that had uh, been conquered they'd just gone through a war period this guy would come through with a band of raiders and steal and pillage from uh these poor towns and cities and kingdoms that had just gone through a, a horrible battle or war but then he sets up, up here in Damascus, all the way up there, he sets up a stronghold there. <clears throat> and this becomes, or this is the beginning of what we see to become the kingdom of Syria that we'll be seeing develop throughout our study in the divided kingdom. But they set him up as a king there right now. It's just a small stronghold. But we see that develop as we go along in our study of the divided kingdom. One thing to keep in mind, too, uh, is that we've mentioned it before, but just to refresh our memory, the Bible is not a uh, history book. It doesn't give us the world history, but the parts of world history that it does record are when it comes into contact with God's people and the story that it's telling. It's revealing God's scheme of redemption and the plan going from Adam to the fulfillment of the seed promise in Jesus Christ. But where world history interacts with that is the portions of accurate world history that we get. 
So we see um, up here to the far right, off of our map, there'll be a, a kingdom called Assyria. The, the capital of that kingdom is Nineveh. And we know about Nineveh, that's where Jonah was sent. We all know that story. But there's a, a kingdom that during this time, it has its ups and downs. It's starting to grow as a world power. You can learn from uh, secular world history. The Assyrians were actually very good at keeping records. And you can read some of their records of their king's conquest. They were very bloody, very brutal people. Um, but during this time, in the beginning, the end of Solomon, uh, the beginning of the divided kingdom, they're kind of growing their power. It's not to a full stature yet. So that's another adversary that is uh, looming. We get a bit of foreshadowing there. But then the third one that we come to here is Jeroboam. And this is an important one. Because Jeroboam becomes the king of Israel. Now Jeroboam is Solomon's servant, actually. Remember, God promised that he was going to take away the kingdom from Solomon and give it to his servant. This is the servant he's talking about. Jeroboam uh, was a very industrious young guy. He was noticed by Solomon. Solomon put him in charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. So let's, let's read uh, 1 Kings chapter 11. We'll start with verse 34. While you're turning there, um, so Jeroboam is, is Solomon's servant. He's leaving Jerusalem one day and he, and he comes into contact with a, a prophet. And this prophet had clothed himself with a brand new garment. And Ahijah, I think is the prophet's name. Yeah, Ahijah. So Ahijah meets him on the road. He's got this brand new garment on. And he stops Jeroboam and he takes off his cloak, his brand new garment, he rips it in 12 pieces. And the prophet tells him, take 10 pieces for yourself. And he relays to him the prophecy that God had told uh, so Solomon. He says, you're going to be the king of Israel. You're going to take 10 tribes and he repeats to him again, because God made a promise to David, you're not going to get all of it, but you're going to get the majority of it. And so let's, let's go ahead and read there. Verse 34. Start with verse 33. Because they have forsaken me and worshiped Asherah and the goddess of Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping the statutes and rules, as David his father did. He's talking about Solomon there. Verse 34. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David my servant, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his hand, son's hand, and I will give it to you, ten tribes. Yet to his son I will give one tribe, that David my servant may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. And I will take you, and I shall reign over, and you shall reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command, and will walk in my ways, and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. I read a little bit farther there than I intended to because I wanted to go ahead and emphasize the point one of the main things we see throughout the, the divided kingdom period is this theme of the uh, blessings of being faithful and the punishment and the curses that come with being unfaithful. And we see that time and again pounded. That point is pounded time and again, maybe more so in this section than any other section that we'll cover. 
And we see that here. What did he say? He said, if you keep my commandments, then he's going to be blessed. Solomon's being cursed because he didn't keep the commandments. That point's going to be rehashed over and over and over again. Anyway, so uh, jo Jeroboam fled. Solomon finds out that Jeroboam's a servant and his kingdom is going to be given to. Obviously doesn't make him happy. He wants to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam flees down to Egypt. Seems like Egypt's the safe haven for all the, <laughs> the uh, opposition of the kings of Israel. Anyway, so he flees down to, to, to Egypt as well. And then when Solomon dies, he comes back. Now Rehoboam, Solomon's son, isn't real wise. It only takes three days for Rehoboam being king for the entire nation to be split. Three days. That's not a good track record. So Rehoboam becomes king. Uh, he goes to Shechem, I believe it is. They all meet up at Shechem. All of Israel gathers there, kind of midway up. And Jeroboam has come back from Egypt. The servant who's going to become the king. He knows he's going to become king. But he leads the people in a political campaign and say, look, Solomon, really, towards the end of his reign, he was being really harsh on us. We had a lot of taxes. It was very heavy burdens. Back off just a little bit there. And so Rehoboam goes and he talks with his, his advisors, the old men. We know this story. The old men. I think there was a lesson here recently on that. Uh, the, the older advisors said, you know, Slack off, you know, don't, don't be so hard on him. But he didn't listen to them. He listened to his, his peers who said, go even harder. So he did that three days later. He tells the people he's not going to slack off at all. And the people don't respond well to that. And Jeroboam leads a rebellion against him. We'll start with in chapter 12, verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 16. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, What portion have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was a taskmaster of taskmaster over the forced labor and all Israel stoned him to death with stones and King Rehoboam hurried to his mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day and when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel there was one there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only here it comes to fruition. The kingdom has been ripped away from the lineage of Solomon, all but two tribes. They'll make up what we refer to as Judah in the southern portion. And ten tribes follow Jeroboam. Rehoboam made one small attempt to regain his kingdom. He sent the, the, uh, the whipping man, the taskmaster, up to try to get the people back on his side and they stoned him to death. It didn't, didn't turn out well for him. Then Rehoboam jumps on his chariot and runs back to Jerusalem to hide with his two tribes. So now we have the, the, the kingdom divided. Unfortunately, Jeroboam, and I, I'm not going to get into that much because I'm sure that's going to be one of our uh, character studies, Jeroboam. Uh, does not follow the word of the Lord. It doesn't take him very long at all. He creates two golden calves, goes into complete idolatry. Uh, things do not turn out well. In fact, every single king of Israel, there is not one king of Israel that's referred to as a good king. They're all considered evil. But that's how we got to where we're at. We've got a divided kingdom now. Why did it happen? It goes back to Solomon. He started not following the commandments. You think about, we, we've been going over the, the kingdom of Solomon and we read about how grand it was and how much money and power that they had. And it can kind of be built up in our minds. But to put this into perspective here, this entire area, you'll notice that's 
40 miles, a 40 mile scale there. This one is a 100 mile scale here. The entire kingdom of Solomon fits into Alabama. That's pretty small. So on the world scale, now in the scriptures, it's all we're work concerned with, right? But on a world scale, they're pretty puny. They're powerful because they got God on their side, but they're pretty puny. Now you get the Assyrian Empire, which conquered all of this, and that's Solomon's kingdom. So that's who they're dealing with. When we go through the divided kingdom and they're being conquered, that's the power that they're up against. Eventually, Israel falls, and it's just Judah alone. So throughout this entire period, we have the prophets, these men who are sent by God to try. I mean, they begged and pleaded with both Judah and Israel throughout this period to come back, to turn away from their evil ways, to turn away from their idolatry, to come back to God. Uh, the most, the two notable ones, and, and there's almost a um, a break uh, in the historical account here to talk about these two men, Elijah and Elisha. We have a lot of material over Elijah and Elisha. These two prophets that are being are trying to get the nations to turn back to God. But then we have the other, what we call the written prophets. Obadiah, Joel, Jonah. Jonah actually is the one, Aaron gave a lesson on that, he's the one sent to Nineveh, which is the capital city of this huge nation that's about to conquer them. That kind of puts that whole story in perspective. Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. All of these men are writing and trying to get either Israel or Judah, sometimes both, to turn back to God. And occasionally they're successful with Judah, uh, but overall, it's just a sad story, really. And they're kind of, most of the time, the prophets are rejects among men. But these aren't the only prophets that we're going to encounter. And I want to make mention of that. That was something that is interesting to me. These are the ones that we think of when we think about prophets because they're the ones we have written down. But there are other prophets that we're going to encounter as we go through the divided kingdom period, uh, for instance, when we're dealing with Ahab, uh, we, there's a prophet that comes to him, I believe he's, he's wounded, he acts as a wounded soldier, um, disguises himself as a wounded soldier to encounter Ahab to prophesy to him. But it says that he comes from the, uh, the sons of the prophets. He comes from this group that's referred to as the sons of the prophets. Um, back in 1 Samuel chapter 10, when David was fleeing from the sight of Saul, it says that he, he joined Samuel and a company of prophets, in quotation marks. So there's some type of group of prophets together, whether it's a school or these prophets live together to encourage one another. I don't know what it is. But there are a lot of other prophets that we encounter that aren't the ones we normally think of. And I want to, to point that out. Sometimes you'll hear about the ma a man of God coming and delivering a message. Uh, and that happens quite a bit in this section. And I want us to, to keep that in mind that Elijah and Elisha and these other men that we typically think of aren't the only ones in the world at the time. And then drawing to a close here, I think the scriptures can summarize this period better than I can. As you heard at the very beginning, I did a pretty terrible job of it. But if we turn to 2 Kings chapter 17, the scriptures does an excellent job of summarizing this period of the divided kingdom. This section here is referring to the end of Israel. Why did Israel fall? This is a little bit of a lengthy reading, but I want to read it anyway. <clears throat> We've got time. 2 Kings chapter 17, starting with verse 7. Talking about the fall of Israel. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God. 
who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out from before the people of Israel, and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and ashram on every high hill and under every green t tree. And there, were, and there they made offerings on all the high places, as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provo provoking the Lord to anger. And they served idols, of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah, by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers and that I sent to you by the, my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen, but they were stubborn as their fathers had been who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenant that, that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false gods and became they went after false gods and became false, and they followed the nations that were around them, concerning whom the Lord concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. And they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made for themselves metal images of two calves, and they made an Asheroth, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served Baal. And they burned their sons and their daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tri tribe of Judah only. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs of, that Israel had introduced. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of the plunderers until he had cast them out of his sight. When he had torn Israel from the house of David, they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit great sin. And the people of Israel walked in all the sins that Jeroboam did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had spoken by all his prophets, his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria unto this day. So if you kind of lost, if you have a short attention span like I did, you might have gotten lost somewhere in there. There's an even shorter summary over in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. I like the way this one ends. Second Chronicles chapter 36, two verses, verses 15 and 16. And this one is actually referring to Judah. After the end of the period referred to as Judah alone. The Lord, but it applies to Israel as well, the entire divided kingdom period. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of God rose against his people until there was no remedy. They kept persisting in evil time and again until it says there was no remedy. There was no way back. I couldn't help but think of this as Ed was giving his study in Revelation the other night, it just comes a point where there's no turning back. There was no way out of this mess they had dug themselves into except for captivity. And sometimes that's where you get to. And sometimes you can come out of it and you're all right, like Judah will. They'll come back and they'll regain the nation of, of Jerusalem or the city of Jerusalem. And through them, as promised to David, will come the Messiah. But sometimes 
just like the nation of Israel, never comes back. They're never regained. And if you find yourself sometime in that point where there's just, you have continued in evil so long that it takes captivity, make sure you make the right decision then. <clears throat> That's the end of my study this evening. Uh, we'll be going into several of these different characters in the, in the coming studies. I believe there's going to be one over Elijah. I'm sure there's going to be some over the good kings as well as the bad kings. Very interesting characters in this, in this study, and I'm looking forward to it as we go forward. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead, do it, like right now, click on it.